Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very proud and very happy to be invited here. And um, like Dr Mock and many others here, we have a passion for what we do. I was so surprised uh, to see that the Bronze Age has moved backwards in time and that uh, it's astonishing to me to see what you said about life 6,000 years ago in China and in Hong Kong and how people travelled and what they did. It's so important that the world understands its past because from the past we can understand the future in a way, where we're headed, where we're going. Beautiful. And Dr Mock, I think your, your stories are wonderful and uh, the lovely chatoyant material from Taiwan and all the other materials you were talking about are quite exceptional. But I must say, I deal in the most gorgeous stones the world has ever seen. And we don't have one colour. We have many colours. We do have chatoyant opals as well. We also have opals with asterisms. And we have opals that are related to dinosaurs. And I could go on and on and on. So uh, next time you want to hear me speak, please bring a pillow and uh, we could go on. But it is my passion, what I've done all my life. Anyway, so I apologise for, for this passion. Now I've got to start the show. Oh, here, OK. Nope. Start. I need you to start the show. Oh, OK. So, for example... If there's a scale of difficulty in the understanding of gemstones, then diamonds would rank number one, the easiest. And the most complicated is actually the family of opal. I'm sorry. So we have opals of all types, opals with play of color, opals without play of color, Opals in host rock materials, rivulets, uh, banded. It's just a huge, huge family. And unless you can understand the type of opal you're actually dealing with and the specific factors that you need to understand, they behave different behaviours. And I'll show you some of them. So how many people here actually know what hydrophane is? Does anybody know here what hydrophane is? I can't see one hand go up in the air. So when you go and buy an opal, it's not just an opal. It could be this material. So this material, hydrophane, has come on the market about 2007 till today. The nomenclature and classification of opal didn't actually cater for the hydrophane material. You Probably a little tip about hydrophane, hydro, means water. And we've got something like 10 million carats a year coming onto the market. In other words, there was piles of it. So we have the family of opal, it's just opal. It's just being sold as opal. But it's not just opal, it has different factors, which care factors are required. So I'll give you an example. So when you weigh this stone in Australia, when we weighed it in Australia, it was 23.64 carats. But if I weighed it in the rainy season in Hong Kong, it would weigh quite a bit more. So you can imagine if you take a parcel and you go to customs, you say this weighed this much and now it weighs that much, it's very confusing for everybody, even the customs officials. So how do you determine what is hydrophane and what is not hydrophane? Well, we immersed it in water, three minutes. The weight is chasing, changing and the translucency or the uh, um, opacity versus uh, transparency is changing and you'll see bu bubbles develop. After nine minutes, you can see a lot more bubbles and you can see the edges as it absorbs the water. The weight is changing, the, um, the specific gravity obviously is there. So how do you measure specific gravity for something that, that takes in moisture? It's quite complicated. So 14 minutes, 32 minutes, and after 65 minutes, it's still changing. So that's not saturated yet. But have a look at the weight now. We had a stone before, 
um, that weighed 23 odd carats, and now we've got one that weighs 26 carats. So that's in a less than, or just over an hour. So this is material is called hydrophane. If you are valuing or wanting to buy, even the consumer wanting to buy must know that difference. So here's another one, black opal. This is not black opal. This is treated hydrophane. Black opal is actually quite a different material, quite completely different behavioural type situation. This material is made black by putting it in clothing dye, um, in Jaipur mostly. And guess what? These poor people, the ones who have suffered, because the people in Ethiopia, they are mining at a level of something like 3,000 metres high in the Rift Valley. They are farmers, they are not really miners. Many people were dying every year because they didn't know to prop the mines and uh, all sorts of accidents and mining uh, without masks, mining so that silicosis is a problem. All sorts of things can be a problem in our life. But these poor people need money and they were selling at very cheap prices and the material um, was being cut and sold and the market got flooded, unfortunately, the prices went from something like $200 a carat material is now available on the market for less than $10 a carat. So who does that hurt? It hurts the industry, it hurts the entire family of Opal, and these poor people, hurt, it hurts the most. So I'm a member of ICA, which is the International Colour Gem Association, and we feel very badly and you know about how some artisanal miners are treated by the world and we intend to do something about it. So um, that's a whole new story on its own, but there is a lot going on uh, behind closed doors and discussions with organisations around the world to try and bring ethics into the industry in a, in a strong way to assist the poor artisanal miners uh, and to the consumer. Consumers being ripped off sometimes, we've got to put a stop to it. So. Um, I'll probably be long dead by the time all this actually really uh, gels, but I think it's important every industry should, I think, use that template. So just now we just talk about a little bit of boring stuff like opal classification. So why do we need it? Um, the Australian opal industry, sorry, the Australian industry for opal is currently reviewing it. In fact, a little update we have finally agreed after three years of negotiations just in Australia. The world hasn't agreed yet, so we've still got a long way to go. We want to ensure that our hydrophane is not confused with the other materials, like uh, Dr. Mock was talking about, you know, jade, phage, or whatever. You know, they're all different species. You know, we, but over history, you can't deny history, but there's actually gemological differences, and people need to know what they are. So classification and terminology used around the world was not being used correctly. So there was no standard universal or global understanding. There was just confusion. The gem labs were also confused. They don't really understand opal that well either. So they didn't have uniform terms. One cert would be told there was something on one organisation. Other magnificent organisations were saying something else. And, you know, it, it just breeds confusion. Confusion destroys trust. So we need trust in our industry. So a absolute disclosure is one of the major things also. The International Colour Gem Associations and, sorry, the ICA and a number of the other organisations are working towards in collaboration. Educational institutions are inconsistent as well then consumer bodies, governments and trade associations are now demanding full and frank disclosure. But how can you disclose something when you don't have a set of rules? So you've got to have a set of rules first. So if industries don't have a clear set of rules based on gemological factors, etc., then they're going to be made for us and they'll be wrong. So there you go, the ICA, uh, International Colour Gem Association, the American Gem Trade Association, the World Jewelry Confederation, SIBJO, are all working now towards universal disclosure codes, which will be on all invoicing and members of all the organisations that are associated with those groups, and we hope to hope it grow, 
Um, so we're planning industry guidebooks. And I'm very happy to say the first guidebook apart from or about a gemstone, we've done coral at Sibjo, uh, we, we have done pearl, and the next one is opal. So I'm very excited that hopefully I'll be a part of that and, and a large team of very sensible, or in, oh, intelligent people apart from myself will be working towards that. So for example, now we've got a classification system uh, that we're proposing. To do that, we have to know how we arrived at that and, and how you actually use it. So the first thing is, the question is, is the opal natural? Has it been treated? Is it synthetic or imitation? So for example, if it's natural opal, it's still in the box on the left. If it's treated opal, it goes into the brown to orange box. If it's synthetic or man has made it, or it's an imitation, whether it's natural imita uh, imitation, such as um, pearl shell or whatever might be used as an imitant. Marine opal from New Zealand, for example, is not opal, obviously. It falls into the blue box. So next, we're going to ask the next question. Is the natural opal impervious or absorbent? Ah, do you remember the hydrophane? So hydrophane is absorbent. It is not impervious. And when we say impervious, we're not talking about 10 decimal points. We're talking about practical. We're talking about a practical absorbency. So there's the natural opal that is impervious stays on the left-hand side, and the absorbent material comes down into the purple box. The third question we're going to ask to achieve which the, what the category is, does the natural impervious opal have play of colour or not? Play of colour is the diffraction of white light into the colours of the spectrum. So if it has play of colour, it stays in the left-hand side. If it doesn't, it falls into the yellow box without play of colour, and that's the family of common opal. So then the last three boxes are natural precious opal with play of colour, natural precious opal with play of colour on host rock, and natural precious opal, precious means, by the way, with play of colour, in the host rock, so on and in. So that's a little bit confusing, but that is defined in the next slide. So if you're interested in opal, I recommend you take a photograph of this. It took us three years to get these words, and I don't think it's still perfect, but anything in life is a continuum. Everything is changing, everything around us. The seat you're sitting on is wearing out. Our skin, our cells are changing. Um, Everything is changing. So there's nothing truly inert. As time goes by, things change. And this will change in time. As we learn more, there might be a few more boxes added. It's not perfect, but it's as good as we could do in three years. So this is our proposal to uh, Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation. Uh, it's the basis for their guidebook. And it is actually... Uh, uh, been hotly debated, but anyway, if you look at those words in um, in uh, bold, you will see they are the essential parts of those terms. So it's not really complicated. So every opal in the world must fit into one of those boxes before you start to look at the type of opal. So these are categories. They're there to protect the consumer, and these must be identified on every invoice in the world using disclosure codes that are agreed to by every member who's a member with the code of ethics. That's the intention. So opal, anybody know what sort of opal that is? Not one hand went up. Okay, that's seam opal. It's type one. Sorry, it's not type one. It's category one. It has play of color. This is also t um, category one. And this is also category one. But what we're doing now is we're actually introducing type. So N1 is a t body tone factor in using the Munsell scale from N1 to N9. So you, we ignore play of color in this instance. 
we're looking at the tone of the stone. You can see on N1 to N9, we've, we've graduated from dark, technically dark, we call black. So N1, 2, 3, 4 are all termed black opal. N5 is a question mark still over that and being hotly debated. I personally think that N5 is very close to the family of black and closer to black than, than white, theoretical white. I would probably like to see half of N5 in the black family. And so, you know, we might say, well, let's call it N4.5. Just a theoretical discussion, a debate that's going on behind the scenes. So beautiful, beautiful black opal. You know, some black opal is selling for five, seven, you know, even ten times the price of a good diamond, a good commercial quality diamond per carat, and some for even much more. People don't realise that, so you couldn't possibly want to buy an opal unless you knew what, it, what you're actually buying. So this is the importance of that. I have to race because I'm running out of time, but um, this is crystal opal. So precious, non-precious. Boulder opal, opal on her strock. Opal on her strock. This is now in the uh, uh, Houston Museum. It's called the Galaxy. It's a stunningly beautiful piece. The photo doesn't do it justice. Then we have all types of opal with calling on her strock. These are some, um, opal nuts, boulder opal nuts. Beautiful crystal. Then we've got. This is also boulder. Sorry, the opal family on her strock. Honduran opal. Opal Matrix from Australia, actually from Koroit, most beautiful patterns, highly desirable. More Matrix, Opal in Matrix. And now we've got Opal without play of colour. All different colours, you couldn't imagine how many colours. We've got various, you know, you can go through it quickly. It's a large family. And what we need to do, I'm just going to race through some of these things. I'll go back to that slide. When I first started in the business, this is how you were greeted. These are the people you were dealing with. There were no banks open. You had to take cash, but you always felt protected because these guys used to look after you. Even though they look terrible, they're absolutely beautiful people. And when you were coming, they just dressed, especially dressed up to welcome you. Anyway, long stories. You know, this is self-explanatory. Please don't bring explosives into the theatre. Does anybody have explosives on them today? I doubt it. But in those days, they did. These are all actually videos. I'm not going to dwell any further. But, you know, this one, modern amenities. <clears throat> this is the drop toilet. And this is the only privacy you would get in those days. And they drive you around in their cars and have a look at the cars. You, you couldn't drive them at night. but if it, Well, you could, but actually you'd end up in, a, in an old mine. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I want to just swing through this as fast as possible. We have opalized fossils. Do they have opalized fossil jade? I don't know. I don't think so. You, is that a yes or a no? I think it was a no. These are age of dinosaur fossils, purely beautifully opalized. Wood, teeth, bones, even mammal fossils we have found, which are extraordinarily beautiful and, and tells us about life in the past. You know, once again, this is not human life. This is the, the, the development of species in the world. So this is totally important. These are master sets, which are, um, there's no more available, but uh, Dr. Mock has beautiful, you know, has a wonderful set. I forget which number your set is, but it, it's going to come next with a classification guide. We're still working on it. I have no time to tell you about this, but there's lo lovely relationships between opals and all these things. You say Mars, chickens, what are we, what's he talking about? Well, very quickly, opal is related to water. There's water in opal. There's bacteria in opal. Opal, this is what Stanford University uh, has said, contamination of uranium. To, not enough time to tell you about it. Uranium, clearly, and this, this is fluorescing green. It also fluoresces blue. Um, we've got weevils, little animals that have got um, photonic crystals, which is like an opal. We're talking about opal. We've got talking about chickens. This one's got four legs. 
I don't have time to tell you the story, but the, the whole project failed. What they were trying to do is that the legs were more important than the wings. They're tastier, juicier. So this company decided to produce chickens with four legs. But the whole thing failed. Do you know why? They couldn't catch them. They were too fast. Just joking. And we have... I'm sorry, I'm going far too long. But we have things like insects have done this. This is opalized wood from Brazil in Piwi. And these little weevils, not weevils, uh, little wood, woodworms, have eaten those holes. And you can see all the scratch marks. It's quite amazing. Opalized wood from Koroit. Um, and this, I was going to tell you, this is actually from Mars. A little bit of Mars there. And guess what's in it? Can anybody guess what's in that little bit of rock? Opal. And what does that say? That says that proved, before they knew for certain, that water was on Mars. And guess what? We have bacteria in opal. What does that mean? Well, we're not really sure yet, but we're looking at it. Because if you've got microbes in opal, and opal is associated with water, and we have water on Mars, and do, are we going to find microbes in meteorites? And then we're going to talk about the beginnings of life on Earth. Did the beginnings of life on Earth actually come from um, a different solar system suggestion four billion years ago? Was that the beginnings of life on Earth? So I'm just, you know, I had 20 minutes really to tell you these things which I could go on and on and on. You wonder about the connection to chickens, ladies and gentlemen? Any guesses? With opal. No one? Okay, this is, this is a long time ago. There you go. Thank you very much. Okay.